Welcome to the Futurist Freelance Podcast, brought to you by Zolo, the operating system of the solo economy. Every week, we'll be serving up an audio cocktail of expert tips, inspired insights, and stories from the frontiers of freelancing to help you grow your borderless business to new heights and live life on your own terms. So kick back, grab a snack, and let's get started. Today's episode of The Future is Freelance. We have one of those interviews where we take a deep dive into a particular freelance niche by talking to someone who's truly mastered it and has the insight to give you actionable tools to investigate it further for yourself. Not least because this is a particularly lucrative and interesting niche with very broad application and demand. We're talking today to Devlin Peck, who is a true master of instructional design. Now, your first response might be, what is instructional design? But I promise you, we will get that defined very early on in the interview. Suffice it to say, it's a name for something that you probably already know a little bit about, but might not understand quite what goes into it. As with a great many aspects of user experience, it's really one of those things where When it's all working perfectly, you almost don't notice it. And that's the beauty of it, because there's so much more to creating an online learning experience than simply gathering up the information. And Devlin understands exactly what it is that freelancers need to know to get hired in this space. Now, he has lots of great insight for us in this interview. He also has a great deal of free content available over at devlinpeck.com. He has some paid material as well, including a very in-depth bootcamp course, which can take you from no knowledge in this space to not only a good working oversight of the techniques, but a portfolio of projects that you can use to get hired. So I'm not going to say any more about it, but I'm going to hand over to the expert to explain much more about this field. And if you're remotely interested in creating great learning experiences online, then I think you're going to enjoy this one. And even if you don't see this as part of your own freelancing offer any time in the future, I think you'll enjoy the insight which Devlin shares about how to build a business around your own specialism, how to create content, and how to get yourself discovered and find work. Enjoy. So Devlin, hello, and welcome to The Future is Freelance. Thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. I'm glad to be here. Well, I can't wait to dive in and understand more about instructional design. But before we unpack that for our listeners, it would be lovely to learn a little bit more about you, um, a little bit more about your history and how you ended up doing what it is you do now. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Devlin Peck. I I got into instructional design pretty early, which isn't really typical of this field. As I was graduating college, like with an undergrad degree in English, I really wanted to teach. So I was looking at like teaching high school English or pursuing a PhD and trying to become a professor. But I really wasn't loving like the freedom afforded by those career paths and like the earning potential there. I really wanted like, you know, location independence. Yeah, I wanted and I and I wanted to earn a good living essentially. So kind of by chance, by accidentally landing a very part-time student job on a training team, I found out more about instructional design. I learned that my, my university, Florida State, had a really good like master's program in instructional design. And I started looking at like the, the you know, advertised like great work-life balance, like high earning potential. And it's a career where you get to help people learn. So instructional right. designers essentially like create learning experiences for people. Um, or make learning experiences better. So that's the whole job. It's like, and particularly in the corporate setting, it's like our employees, for example, might have these knowledge and skill gaps. They don't know what we need them to know or they can't do what we need them to do. So we're going to turn to instructional designers to help people learn what they need to know or do what they need to to do very like efficiently and effectively. So that's the job. And I was intrigued because 
especially because a lot of it is um, in an in e-learning format. So it's a, like this on this computer-based, self-paced kind of deliverable. And I was like, that seems like something I could create from a laptop <laughs> or something I could yeah. do from a laptop while traveling Europe, for example, which mm-hmm. is like what my mind was set on at the time when I was 22. <laughs> um, well, it's a good plan. Uh, so yeah. when what year did you do your master's? Because I'm thinking how much everything's changed in the last couple of years and the way that yeah, learning good, now happens. Good point. I started that in 2017. So right. I started okay. my master's a week after graduating undergrad, and that's the same the same semester that summer is when I started getting my freelance business off the ground in this space as well. So it's been an interesting few years, I'm sure, with the, the <laughs> way that the, least, yeah. the whole world learns has changed so much. Um, what's that What's that learning curve been like for, for you and your customers as well? Because I'm sure that, you know, we've, we've just had this roller coaster from everything locked down to now a more blended experience. How's, how's that reflected in instructional design? Um, well, when I, when I got into this space, like there was already a pretty healthy demand for instructional designers. There was a big demand for this e-learning kind of work. Like there were already a lot of companies and teams moving over to this like self-paced e-learning type of format, which they needed IDs for. Once COVID first hit within the first several months, like a lot of projects were like put on pause because, Mm -hmm. you know, there was so much like uncertainty on what that meant for the economy in the world yeah but pretty soon after that projects just kind of started exploding in the in this learning space because so many companies were going fully remote and so many you know they still needed to train their employees they needed the people to learn so people just started getting slammed with works freelancers especially Mm. um so many you know we need to convert this face-to-face learning experience maybe you know hundreds of hours of face-to-face learning experiences into this self-paced online e-learning and that's been going strong ever ever since the pandemic started and i don't see any signs of it really slowing down (laughs) no well there's no going back is there whatever um some managers seem to think we 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 don't have a button to (laughs) switch everything back to the pre-pandemic world certainly well in my house it's we have two full-time remote workers and now two full-time remote students as it's turned out because neither of them particularly wanted to go back into that classroom environment and my eldest is studying with the open university in the uk which nice. which is a really interesting e-learning experience because i studied with them hundreds of years ago i did my dms with them back <sighs> when they used to ship you boxes of books and <laughs> i think we had we had some kind of online forum but the delivery was based it was completely self-paced and now they're using it's adobe connect i think and it does seem very basic compared to what I know is possible in e-learning, but I guess it's that lowest common denominator experience for students all over the world with whatever bandwidth and equipment they've got. I imagine in corporate, it's very different and you can do amazing things now to to really make learning happen. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's an early example of the field like distance learning. Like that was some of the earliest ways I was exposed to it. I was doing some research in like an island nation and they were talking about how mm. they taught people at the different islands by shipping them practice worksheets and and textbooks basically. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the field has been around like this remote learning has been around like pre-technology for sure or pre, you know, modern tech. But yeah, in the corporate space, yeah, they devote very large budgets to it. They have very many yeah. tools at their disposal. Um, the format is a little bit different. It's a little bit unique in the corporate space. Like if you're familiar with education, yeah, it might be these like virtual instructor led experiences where it's someone Mm -hmm. talking to you on essentially a Zoom call or Adobe Connect or um, in a learning from a learning management system where you might go on there, the professor has set it up and it's some really, yeah, it's a lot of text, maybe some PDFs and maybe, maybe some like practice quiz questions at most. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um The corporate space, by and large, uses a tool called like Articulate Storyline 360. That's like the most popular tool. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a really powerful version of PowerPoint. Um, But instead of just designing a presentation that a facilitator needs to click through with an audience, you design these self-paced, slide-based learning experiences. So it's like an interactive simulations you can build uh, so people can control them completely on their own. So if, if anyone listening has like, gotten a job at any point in the past 10 to 15 years, you may have 
been assigned some of this learning. And some of it is really, really boring. <laughs> That's like the common <laughs> perception. It's like, oh, I have to go slog through some like super information heavy <laughs> slide based right. courses. But there, are, there is some really cool, like more gamified type stuff out there where it does feel like you're, yeah, that, that is much more engaging, I would say. Oh, that's, that's interesting to hear. I love that it's called Storyline coming at it from a storytelling <laughs> point of view. I like the idea yeah. of seeing learning as a journey and hopefully some kind of narrative arc. I think certainly in talking to people doing remote work in various contexts now, it does seem that there's been a huge learning curve for employers and hirers, especially with onboarding remotely. That's been the one thing, even if they had remote work policies in place before it would be a case of get everybody in show them how to do the thing then let them go and do it wherever they want to whereas that big adaptation has had to be okay we can't bring new hires in we have to onboard them completely remotely and I suppose that's where what you do really comes to the fore in trying to make that hopefully not a boring experience somebody's first impression Yeah, that's a very common type of project for instructional designers working on onboarding experiences and making Mm -hmm. sure that, yeah, the employee experience is good. There's usually like a blend of like the methodologies used there. There's usually a blend of like the self-paced e-learning experiences and the live instructor-led experiences, but virtual instructor-led in this case Mm -hmm. to bring people together, you know, form discussions, get some like live feedback and practice. And then people are generally like sent away to do some self-paced stuff and they come back with the group. So that's a very common format we see for those onboarding experiences. Yeah, it seems to be getting quite popular even in sort of public access courses now that it's more cohort based with more live synchronous elements to hopefully keep people moving through it. I suppose maybe the the completion rates for completely self-paced stuff is a bit is a bit low and the new ways of bringing people along with it yeah and i think people generally like to learn together and a mm. lot of the learning does happen peer to peer like you may miss things in the in the formal content but a lot of times mm. people learn stuff by asking the person sitting next to them so to speak yeah. maybe virtually well, sitting next to them but that's, that's a how we did it at it, school sure. <laughs> you know, yeah exactly I, social learning see your element. notes with the, yeah <laughs> what is she yeah. talking about? Yeah, let's get together and study this. So it sounds like there's there's a huge range of different applications and directions. What are the opportunities for freelancers here then? Because I know that's where you specialize in helping freelancers get into this industry in the first place. Yeah, what helped me find success very quickly as a freelancer, and and it's still probably the most in-demand skill set in the space is when you can combine these strong like writing and people skills with the technology skills. Mm. So in, so the, the instructional design field, there's kind of two big bodies of work right now. It's like the instructional design work. And that's where you're maybe talking to the subject matter experts. So the people who specialize in the content area, you're talking to them and learning from them. Um, you're reviewing maybe existing content. And then you're writing learning objectives and writing the content itself, which may be in the form of scripts or storyboards. Mm -hmm. So that's like very people and writing oriented. It's like the upfront work. After that, either you yourself would do this next step or you would hand it off to a developer. That's when you actually work out the graphics and actually develop the learning experience in a tool like um, Articulate Storyline. Or if you're developing it for an instructor-led session, you might be developing the facilitator guide uh, any and any supporting documents that the, the audience may need and that sort of thing. Mm. So people really like working with freelancers or for like freelance shops, so to speak, if you have people you outsource to who can do both of those pieces, who can yes. do, who can work with the experts, write the content really well and develop it into a final product. That, that makes people's lives really easy. Agencies mm, yes. will generally differentiate it more. Like yeah, kind so of will have, an agency have a team then of the story person and the tech person? Exactly. Yeah, the agencies like, will have it more differentiated usually, you know, not in every mm-hmm. case. But if some people are like, I only want to do the upfront instructional design work, I don't want to touch the technology. Agencies are probably a pretty good place to look for that because they have it more differentiated. Whereas yes. if you're working direct for the client, they want to work with someone who can take it all the way. Unless they just need you to fill a very specific need for their in-house team, which yeah. happens sometimes too. 
No, that makes sense. It also makes a lot of sense that it's a good freelance gig because it's going to be project driven, isn't it? We need a particular oh, yeah, absolutely. thing. We don't need a, necessarily somebody on staff on a permanent contract, but we need a particular learning experience created or an onboarding sequence or a, a particular thing. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, what is, exactly. How hard is it to learn then? I mean, you mentioned a, a very specific tool that sounds fascinating, this storyline thing, but you know, if somebody was was starting that maybe with some background in education, but not necessarily a technical background, how difficult is it to get up and running and be able to market yourself in this role? That's a great question. If we're going to say like computer programming or software engineering is like a mm -hmm. 10, like learning how to code yeah. from scratch and build web applications, learning storyline is like a 1.25. <laughs> Okay, so that's that doesn't suggest that it's quite an easy ride that somebody can no, almost teach themselves. The the um, interface looks almost the same as PowerPoint on first glance. So if you're comfortable with PowerPoint, there is a bit of a learning curve. Like there are some new features to add this mm -hmm. like you know interactive element, um, and and you can get more advanced with it when you use like variables and conditions, and you you even can do like some custom JavaScript. But I would say like 98% of working instructional designers are not even using some of those most advanced features. So oh, to do what you would need to do for most of the freelance work out there, yeah, you can pick it up relatively easily. Okay. And what would a typical background of a freelancer be? Is it someone in education or are they marketing or... HR type people thinking about these onboarding sequences and who are they? There are a lot of people moving into the field from education, especially since 2020. Like it is a very natural progression from education, but there are people from all over so many different industries because it is so interdisciplinary. Mm, um, you can apply skills from so many different disciplines. So designers, corporate trainers, teachers, um, and then a lot of people find their way into this space because they're working some really random job and then they wind up kind of getting the training responsibilities dumped on them. <laughs> so like, hey, you're really right. good at this really specific niche thing. Can you design some training to help other, other people do it? Right. And then they start working on that and they're like, hey, I, I really like this. What what is this even called? What are the opportunities out there for this? <laughs> yes. Well, I, yeah. What is it even called? I think it's probably the, the starting point for a lot of people, I guess. Um, and almost that learning how to do a new thing, particularly in a new job or environment, is all, almost like a, a hygiene factor. You, you only notice it if there is a problem. And if it's really slick, part of the whole user experience, hopefully you almost don't even appreciate how good it is or yeah. how much, how, how good you are at your job that you've made it easy for them to become an expert at theirs really quickly. And they maybe don't even question um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how much of a shortcut you've helped them with. So it's not necessarily people with a particularly technical background. Definitely not. This. And people come from teaching and they get an instru they do instructional design work for like technical cloud computing concepts. Mm. <laughs> like okay. the, as the yeah. instructional designer, your job is to be the expert in how people learn and how to best right. present information and media to help people learn effectively. So you have to be really comfortable with learning because you will, mm -hmm. like I've worked on such a, you know, very complex, like biology, healthcare projects, like right. mining projects, like, you know, physical mining, <laughs> e-learning, um, wow. tech projects all over the place. And I don't know a thing about some of those topics before getting involved. That's interesting. So it, there's almost a kind of naive facilitator advantage of like a beginner's mind. Of, exactly. That's what I think. That's how I view unknown. it. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's really interesting. Because I'm thinking about particularly in the tech industry, there are an awful lot of freelancers working in various tech roles, but on the corporate side, there's a lot of churn at the moment and maybe there's a lot more people on the market who've got various knowledge skills but they don't know how to bring those to market as a freelancer um, or how to teach other people to do what they do so maybe this is a pathway that they could be looking at to learn how to deliver it as a learning experience more generally um, and then maybe you never have to go back to doing your niche technical thing. Yeah well I think there are a lot of opportunities there from like the yeah, from the freelance perspective, I think if someone looks at a portfolio that is more specialized or niche down, that shows off those, yeah, that subject matter expertise, in addition to the learning expertise, I think that will, of course, give you an advantage over someone who 
doesn't show off that technical expertise at all because like mm-hmm. there is a bigger learning curve and it's going to take more time to get up to speed if if they can yeah. work with a freelance instructional designer who can already talk the talk so to speak they're probably going to prefer that <laughs> that wasn't me though yeah. com- coming right out of college with no background <laughs> <laughs> No, well, it just shows that, you know, you can go broad or you can go deep, can't you? And as freelancers, we're really lucky that we can choose to almost follow the the pathways that interest us and the trends that are happening in the moment. And um, that's sort of the beauty of it. I, I mean, one of the things I love as a freelancer is the fact that you can learn anything now. And, you know, I say this to my daughters that you don't know how lucky you are that if I wanted to study something when I was your age, I had to go to a library or, or find a, a course delivered by a human after work or, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Whereas everything they have is a tap away. If they just get off TikTok, there's, there's something out there. Somebody <laughs> will have created probably free all the resources they need to go and learn and I think I I suppose the flip side of that is that the quality is hugely variable there's an awful lot of low quality information um self-serving information and so on and indeed one of the things that certainly freelancers over recent years are always seem to be encouraged to do is well just make a course you know whatever you're the expert in cake decoration or an a niche web three programming language or whatever, just make make a course and share it and put it out there. And it does seem that there, there are a lot of tools for people to do that. Again, some of them have a, a cost, some of them have a learning curve, and there's a course you can get to learn how to develop a course in whatever you want to develop a course in. <laughs> what do you yeah. <laughs> what do you think as an industry professional about these self-access platforms like Thinkific and Teachable and Kajabi and so on that freelancers are encouraged to use? Is is that the best way to go? Um, yeah, good question. And I think there are a few ways to tackle this. So full, so full disclosure, so that is kind of the direction I wound up heading. So after Mm -hmm. freelancing, while I was freelancing, I started creating content for other instructional designers, because I was like helping my friends and stuff in person. And I'm like, I'm repeating myself a lot. I'm just going to make a big guide and put it out there. Yeah. And then especially in 2020, that started blowing up kind of there were a lot of people who wanted to get into the field. I was getting, you know, I it was feeling very re- rewarding working with people like that. And then I eventually created a, a paid course or bootcamp program to help people build mm-hmm. their portfolios and get in the space. And that's helped me like multiply my freelance income quite heavily and get like more freedom and stuff like that. <laughs> so it has worked sure. out quite well for me. And it really helped me having that like learning design background while I was... Mm you know, diving into creating that courses, because it kind of felt like a very similar exercise, only instead of making it for the client, I was making it directly for my audience. Um, And of course, the tools are a bit different. I'm not using like Articulate Storyline, like I am using Teachable in this case. Um, On the flip side of that, I have paid for another course from someone who wasn't an instructional designer. And it was essentially like a series of hour and a half long PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> and I felt like, wow, like, cause I, I've always been like self-conscious. It's like, you know, I, I always want to be making my stuff better. Like, you know, is, are people going to be happy with what they're paying for? But then when I paid more, uh, you know, a higher price point than my own program for something else, I was, I felt quite disappointed, but quite reassured in the quality of our own stuff after I saw like what else was out there. Yeah. Well, th- yeah, I think this idea that you know, yes, these tools are fairly easy to use in terms of navigating the back end of it and where to stick lesson one and how to upload the video file or whatever, but nobody's teaching how to make a great learning experience out of all of that. Yeah. And yeah, I will, as I said earlier, that you can teach yourself anything online, you can find whatever you want, but in terms of the actual learning experience, I will agree with what you found that the quality of that learning experience can be hugely variable and it doesn't seem to bear any relationship to the price of the course or the subject. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's really hard to get a steer on what's going to be a good way to learn or not. Um, all the millions of reviews they've got from their friends or whatever. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really hard to, to know how to buy good learning. Mm-hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. And yeah, with 
like to your point on the teachable thing, yeah, it's like, you know, I know how to use Google Docs, so I'm a great writer. <laughs> it's like there, of course, <laughs> is more to it <laughs> with <laughs> with um, yeah. learning design. I think a bit one of the principles that could probably go really far is like designing practice opportunities, like let, giving people chances mm. to apply what they're learning is really helpful versus just like, here's an information information presentation, go and have fun with it. And then there's so much yes. more like sequencing and scaffold, you know, structuring it. Well, we could do it multiple podcasts on learning design, but um, yeah, I think I, I imagine there are content creators out there who do make it seem like it's super easy to create a good course that people will love, mm -hmm. but there is, you know, that is a, a big lift, so to speak. Oh, I guess the other piece yeah. around that is learner feedback. Like when, whenever I build a course or an offer like that, I get pilot groups in there and I meet with them every week and review the content and the plan right. with them every single week. So that that too, that one little thing, if you're like talking to the audience you're serving as you build the course and regularly afterwards, that is going to make a big difference. Just listening to what your audience yeah. like wants and needs and helping deliver that. That's, yeah, that kind of building it in public, at least with a small group and doing it in a really consultative way. Maybe that's the bit that's often missing. I think that these courses about how to make courses are often very much geared around the sales funnel and throwing enough people in at one end that they pay um, and quite what they get out of it at the other end beyond that five-star review is less important or less prioritized sometimes, whereas it sounds like you build it in a very different way from the ground up in terms of what the user needs, and that's really differentiated. So tell me about your boot camp then. Um, we've already established that people can get into this, this space from a lot of different routes and backgrounds, but where do you take them when, when they come along to your course? How, how long is it? What does it involve? And what, what would they expect to get out of it? Yeah, good question. The boot camp is kind of a heavy lift. It's like five to six months or so. Um, it is right. focused more on learning the skills of the field. So it starts with Articulate Storyline pretty heavily. And then it follows this like instructional design process that I would use with my clients going through mm -hmm. from, from like storyboarding all the way through like a final e-learning project for your portfolio. Um so learn storyline, build this really strong flagship project, which you would probably like because it's like story driven and scenario based. So it's like you're immersing people in a story and they're making choices they would have to make on the job. And if they mess up, they're like seeing the consequences of that choice. So it's a really right. cool type of project that you can build with storyline. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it's building the portfolio website, because that's kind of the key to getting the freelance work is having a strong yes. portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, all the theory, but no practice is. I should say it's not going to get anybody hired in in a field that, even if it's in demand, it's going to be competitive. So five or six months, it sounds pretty intense. Because I was going to challenge you with, you know, how can this boot camp be equivalent to you doing a master's in the subject? But it sounds like it is a big commitment and a, a big investment of work for the student as well that they should come out of it with a portfolio and a project under their belt. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely an investment. It's not like an information. It's it's like a very practical, like you're going to need to start creating deliverables from the first week, essentially. It's not like a passive yeah. kind of experience. But I also I just watch a couple have of videos, a, yeah. so much free content on how to do that, like you're saying online. Like, so if, if you are looking for something more passive or you don't need like feedback and coaching, because that's, you know, there's feedback on every deliverable too. Like in the bootcamp, right. that's how we've, yeah, built that program up. But if you want to get a sample or you want to, yeah, you're really good at like self-learning. There's so much for the past, like two plus years, I've been creating all of that content on YouTube for free. So that's a good place to Brilliant. start. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's really important. What you said about whether you're good at self-learning or not as well, because that self-awareness of even how you best learn is something that that's a piece that not everybody's got their head around yet don't yeah, say it yeah, um, that's a good point. some people can read a book or some people need a video or some people need to I, I think I tend to learn a great deal from audio content which is probably why I've ended up in podcasting but I <laughs> yeah. listen to a huge number of podcasts and audio books as well and sometimes I don't know I feel it goes in better if my eyes are doing something else and <laughs> rather than mm. I'll I'll glaze over looking at well maybe if it's just another terrible powerpoint 
but or maybe we just need better, more engaging visual experiences. I don't know. Or maybe we spend too long looking at screens and it, yeah. it's good to have the material another way. But yeah. So what, what do you think are the, the issues in terms of learning style then and different ways of how does instructional design get a, a, around that with all the different media and modes we have at our disposal so this wasn't in the list of questions i sent you i'm just shooting off on one now because you're making me think (laughs) no yeah that's good i'm down to go anywhere it takes the conversation takes us but learning styles is kind of like a a no-no word in the instructional design space because interesting why is that then because there's like some really popular um content around learning styles that kind of spread like wildfire throughout the teaching space and I think even started penetrating like the instructional design space but then some like serious some researchers actually were like let's take a look at this and see if there's any like merit to it and like time and time again multiple reproduced studies they're like your learning style doesn't have any impact on like how well you learn whether it's you know when Mm -hmm. I say learning styles I'm referring to like the audio visual kinesthetic like those things that people listening mm. may be familiar with there will be people very quick to crucify you if you mention that like in the inst- <laughs> on like instructional design social media and the like um oh that's interesting people have preferences so if i say i like to listen i like to learn by listening that's really just about a preference rather than yeah, learning yeah. better and that yeah that, and that's that okay and you may definitely enjoy it more and there may be a case to mm-hmm. be made for that but i think people talk about it as like oh yeah we need to accommodate all learning styles that's not going to be very realistic, especially in like the corporate learning design setting. And then the research shows like, even if it's not their preferred style, they they'll still be able to learn just as effectively. So it's like, we'll get there in the same way. I guess people might just not like prefer it as much the method by which they learned. Um, Yeah. As far as making those decisions. They learn in different ways, learn it twice. I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's, there's something about there's different pathways, teaching things in different ways as well, or if you don't understand it, on a video then listen to something and go for a walk or read a book or find a different way to get it into your brain yeah i think that's generally how those decisions are made in the instructional design space like you would generally do some degree of analysis so you would want to learn a lot about the people you're serving like what does their day look like where would they even have time to fit in a learning experience Mm. um what devices do they have available to them you would want to get a really good picture of like who you're serving and if you find that yeah they're mostly walking around they are like having to look at things or you know they spend a lot of time walking from one site to another that would be a really good case for a podcast you know you want to teach you know design a audio only learning experience because they could do Mm. it on the job pretty pretty easily if it's like a retail employee like working on the floor for example you're probably not going to want to design a desktop based learning experience for them you might be able to design something on the phone that they could look at for a couple minutes at a time yeah Uh, yeah. So makes total questions sense. like so that are usually yeah. what decides which tools and which mediums you're using to help people learn, like their environment. So it's, it's much more practical then rather than something airy fairy about learning styles. It's about how are they going to consume this? How is it going to fit into their lives, their, their use yes. of devices and their yes, activities? Exactly. Now that's, that's fascinating. Okay. Now it's given me lots to think about, but <laughs> for anybody who who is really captivated by this idea or just wants to learn more about instructional design what do you think 2023 is going to bring um where's the industry going and what are the trends and opportunities people should be looking out for that's a good question this field and one thing i'll say is that it is kind of slow to change from what i've experienced when i was getting into the field I was under the opposite impression. Like my professors and everything were like, yeah, the tech you're using today is going to be this, you know, it's going to be different in two or three years. Articulate Storyline has been the go-to tech since before I got into the field. And it seems to be even more the go-to tech now. (laughs) So that didn't really hold true. And then when I got into Mm -hmm. the field, I was really interested in like some more cutting edge kind of stuff. Like when you look at all the trends articles and everything, I was like, I'm going to dive deep into that. And then I realized after like, creating content about that stuff and kind of trying to work with clients on it for like two plus years. I'm like, wait, they've been saying the same stuff 10 years ago and it hasn't really grown anywhere new. (laughs) So (laughs) this field is kind of, it is fairly traditional in some ways. Now there are people doing cutting edge stuff with like, you know, HoloLens and like AR, VR type experiences, um, really advanced like data tracking stuff. Like there Mm -hmm. are teams doing that. It's not really the norm. Um, the biggest 
no surprise here, but I think the biggest like tech shift in the industry in the past couple of months has been with artificial intelligence. How can mm. it not be <laughs> with how much that's stirring stuff up? So I'm seeing a lot of people um, try to use chat GPT in their work and see how I'm posting about how that can help them. Um, there are, and then there are a lot of generative AI tools too that are help that teams are actually using today to save time and money like synthesia you know where you can use like the artificial avatar basically uh Mm -hmm. lifelike voices that is a very big demand has been a big demand that is something that has very materially changed recently instead of working with voiceover actors there are a lot of teams switching over to tools like well-said labs and the like and they're getting Mm -hmm. very realistic sounding voices at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time so yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll have to give way to AI podcasters eventually, but not going down without a fight. So <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> especially but if you've lost the voiceover work. <laughs> yeah, but as far as like the tech landscape, I think that's going to be the biggest change. Um, yes, but yeah, I think the demand is going to be as high as ever in 2023 and beyond, just because of mm. yeah the nature of the workforce today and how yeah. how remote it is. Definitely, and how fast things are changing, even things like assimilating, working with automation and AI and so on, I think. But that's really fascinating that the tech hasn't changed that much. And actually, the learning theory that underpins it, I mean, some of that has been around for centuries. Obviously, we debunk learning styles, but a lot of the theory has has clearly not been unchanging for a very long time, and it isn't going anywhere. So you can learn it and, and keep applying it in new contexts. Yeah. Yeah. And and especially and as people are coming in from different fields, you see stuff get applied in different ways. Like that is why it's really mm-hmm. cool because people are coming from so many different places. So sometimes you see, a, yeah, sometimes people like Im- implement the learning st- uh, theories in a way that you haven't seen before. And then it kind of generates a lot of interest. So if you are yeah. creative, um, yeah, there is a lot of opportunity to stand out. And because it's so interdisciplinary, Fantastic. if you're like, pretty good at one particular thing like animation or coding or graphic design you you know maybe in a pool of other graphic designers you're like you know pretty middle of the line but once you're in the pool of instructional designers you become like the expert the graphic design person graphics (laughs) man yeah yeah exactly (laughs) because there are so many different ways you can specialize because it's so interdisciplinary or storytelling for example if you specialize in that you're going to get noticed for it and get work as a result of it Excellent. Well, I'm sure that lots of our listeners are going to be responding to this and thinking, hmm, you know, what could my niche be? Where would I go next? So you mentioned you've got lots of free content. Where should we send people who to satisfy that curiosity and learn a bit more? Yeah, um, all my content is on either YouTube or my website. So Devlin mm-hmm. Peck, you can just search me on YouTube or Google. And if you want to reach out to me directly, uh, LinkedIn is the social media I'm most active on. And that instructional right. designers as a whole, I would say, are most active on. Excellent. Well, we'll put all of that into the show notes because I think a lot of people are going to want to follow this learning rabbit hole at least a little bit further. And who knows, maybe some of them will make it all the way to the boot camp and a whole new career because it sounds like there really are an awful lot of opportunities out there that people perhaps didn't know about. So thank you. Thank you very much, Devlin, for enlightening us. I know I've learned a great deal and really appreciate you sharing that with our listeners. Yeah, you're welcome. Always happy to talk about instructional design. So anytime. You've been listening to the Future is Freelance podcast brought to you by Zolo.io, who offer compliance, taxation, invoicing and admin solutions for fiercely independent solopreneurs across the globe. From simply getting paid to launching a full EU-based limited company, Solo has you covered thanks to Estonian e-residency and a superb suite of streamlined business software. If you enjoyed the show, please like, rate and comment and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts.